I was just on the freeway and I got a call and I answered it and uh, it was the manager saying uh, we got to let you go you know the Padres no longer need your services and it was pretty transactional and that was it and I hung up and then I just kept driving and and it was sort of surreal but in my heart I knew that I was done and I remember telling my parents it was the morning of Thanksgiving and I just remember telling them that that that, that would be it and I cried and yeah it was yeah I'll never forget it it was really hard to tell them that Hi, friends, and welcome back to At the End of the Tunnel. Today's guest is a former pro athlete, an author, and a functional movement trainer. His name is Logan Gelbrick, and he is the co-founder of the uber-popular functional movement gym in Venice, California called Deuce. Logan is widely considered to be a coach's coach, and he's been traveling the world conducting what's called the Hold the Standard Summit. And his mission is to use his platforms and his uncompromising approach to coaching to inspire us to go after our dreams. I met Logan a few years ago when I was a Venice resident, and after having been in gyms for years, I had never experienced anything like Deuce. There are no mirrors, there's no hiding behind your headphones. It's a bit like working out outside in that bar from Cheers, you know, the sitcom from the 1980s where everybody knows your name. Well, as a kid, Logan had aspirations of becoming a professional baseball player, but unlike millions of other kids, he actually achieved it. He played ball in high school, college, then he was drafted by the San Diego Padres, but his career ended after only two seasons. And that's when Logan realized that his true calling was less about baseball and more about pushing himself to give 100% to whatever he was doing. And it just happened to be baseball. But after baseball, Logan began to offer fitness training for regular people. But his approach was different, right? He treated his clients like athletes. His philosophy was to create a space where both coaches and clients were inspired to hold a standard of excellence. And after many years of training in parks, Logan invested his entire life savings into what became Deuce Gym. And through a lot of sweat and tears, Logan succeeded in creating an oasis in the fitness world. He began teaching his philosophy of establishing and holding the highest possible standard around the globe. And more recently, he wrote a book about his philosophy called Going Right a logical justification for pursuing your dreams. It was a pleasure having this conversation with my friend and learning more about his adventures in establishing Deuce. And I'm excited for you to hear more of Logan's story as well. So without further ado, I present to you, my dear listeners, Mr. Logan Gelbrick. So Logan, welcome to At the End of the Tunnel. I always like to start these conversations talking about childhood. And I I normally ask the question, you know, what was your favorite toy or activity as a kid? But I I suspect I know the answer to that question. But for (laughs) for those listeners who don't know you as well as I do, can you just tell us what your favorite toy or activity was? Yeah, I think the truest answer, the one that you're alluding to is my fascination with baseball. As a young kid, I sort of really gravitated towards baseball and more specifically than maybe most American young boys, I decided at a really, really young age, maybe inappropriately young age, that I I wanted to see that through. And what I mean by that is I wanted to play professional baseball. So, you know, ages four, five, six, I was spending a lot of time doing that. But I did have a, an incredible fire truck pedal car that was maybe a, a, a strong second light. What was it about baseball that attracted you out of all of the sport, the available sports? You know what? I don't know. I, I think if I'm going to tell this part of my life with true sort of accuracy, I think we we want to romanticize that someone is like destined for something. Mm-hmm. And I think if I'm being honest about it, it looked like genuine curiosity. And that grew over time. I mean, I can't look anyone in the face and say at age five, I just knew that the the essence of baseball was in my DNA. I mean, that couldn't have been true. However, as you nurture this curiosity and sort of go down the path with a little bit of passion and rigor, then you get to like meet 
different interesting parts of certain passions or or commitments. And so earlier than most, but definitely years later, I'm learning that there are these beautiful metaphors for life in baseball. There's this blue collar work ethic there. And there's this introduction to failure that is so kind of woven into the sport. You know, baseball is in many ways opposite of some other popular American sports. You know, it's not Friday night lights. It's every day. No one aces baseball. <laughs> you know, it's impossible. It, part of that process is is embarrassing failure, you know. So I, I, later, I really connected to those aspects of the sport. Right. I'm curious, though, about five or six-year-old Logan. And did you try other sports? That's the first question. Second question, was your dad into baseball? Did you see a movie or a show that kind of glorified pro baseball? Like, what, what were some of the other influences around baseball? Like, who even took you to your first baseball match? Right. Yeah. I mean, of course, my dad was a fan of baseball. He played it as a you know a high schooler. My grandfather, my my mom's dad, played professional baseball, and so I think a lot of these things are just they begin with access, you know, and I had um, access to a little toy bat and a ball and a friend, a neighbor friend who lived right behind me. It was a, you know, like a little three foot wall that I could hop over and jump, <laughs> jump, jump down to his backyard and, and it was on, you know. So, so that access, I think, created a place for fun. And when you start having fun doing something, there's the hook, right? And so, there was absolutely access. My dad had an interest in in nurturing that, but but also it's worth mentioning that unlike other folks who end up playing a sport at a high level, I feel very fortunate that there that didn't come with pressure or some sort of expectation or kind of overbearing parents in that way. But I think I was just having fun, you know, mm. and it looked like a lot of wiffle ball in the yard, and that's kind of how it started. Do you remember what you liked about baseball as a kid? I liked hitting. Everyone likes hitting, you know. There's something about accomplishing that. I mean, even 20 years later, you know, age what 24, 25, playing at a completely different level, I was still mesmerized by the miraculous nature of hitting a baseball. <laughs> it, it seemed impossible at age 4 and it seemed impossible, maybe more impossible at age 24. So, there's just a Something about trying and trying to make that miracle happen was really exciting to me as a little kid. Hmm. What team did your granddad play for? He was in the Giants organization. And yeah, I mean, his career probably, I don't know a lot about it, but probably looked a lot like mine. A pretty brief farm system level career, you know, but um, it is a romantic story, you know, seeing your granddad in black and white holding an old timey glove and a bat getting on a train to go to go to camp is, I don't know, it, it became something endearing that I kind of connected to. And yeah, I just, I, I fell in love with that idea. Did you have a relationship with your granddad where he kind of talked about the good old days of playing ball? No, he died when I was pretty young. So I do remember times with him, but I I wasn't old enough to connect with him about baseball, you know? So it was mostly like later stories about how he was, who he was, the type of player he was. Hmm. And you grew up where? I was born in Santa Monica and I grew up in Playa del Rey, Westchester area, just just sort of south of, of where I met you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right by the airport. My mom is actually retiring right now after 49 years of flying as a flight attendant with United. So, we were right oh. by the airport there. Wow. And your yeah. dad took you on a very special trip when you were a kid. That's right. Related to the, baseball. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that was the uh, the pilgrimage to a place called Cooperstown, New York, which is home of uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so, you know, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure my mom is rolling her eyes about all the other beautiful places in the world, but she, <laughs> she, she went along with us. And yeah, I mean, it was just kind of this, this epic adventure to sort of see in the flesh a lot of the, the things that you start to idolize as a young kid. And, and I'll never forget the moment I actually, I mention it in the book to my dad at like a really young age, he called me over to one of the displays and in the display was an award called the Triple Crown, which is mm -hmm. 
it's rarely, rarely awarded because you need to lead the league in average RBIs and home runs. And so it's not something that's awarded every year. It's, it's only awarded when that happens. And there was only, you know, a handful of names on the, on the award. And so I egotistically slid my finger a couple of spaces down and said, you know, this is where my name's going to go. And, uh, and that was a moment that I think I remember it quite specifically because I think it was the first moment that both my dad and I knew what I wanted to do and also had a mutual understanding that both of us were aware of the significance of saying something like that. Mm. What was his response? His response was more of like a look. And I don't know if he said this out loud, but this is what I heard, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was that, you know what that means, right? And again, I don't know if he explicitly said that, but I was clear and he was clear. And to answer that sort of rhetorical question is that the only way that something like that would be possible is if I began a journey that allowed me to realize as much or all of my potential possible. And I would have to work harder than I could even imagine at that age for decades just to have the chance for something like that to happen. And even still that it wouldn't be guaranteed, you know? And so I signify that moment in time as a key moment in my life because I'm the type of individual that really respects the goals and the desires of other people, especially audacious ones. You know, you hear all these stories about people in their youth sharing their goals with other people, specifically elders, you know, people who are more senior to them and mm -hmm. being unsupported or sort of like shamed in mild ways or, or major ways. That breaks my heart. You know, I can't really imagine telling someone that they can't or that they shouldn't do something that they really want to do. Mm -hmm. However, asking or wishing or dreaming to do something like that is the easiest moment of that process. You know, that that is the the simplest part of accomplishing something great. And so I think there's a call to action there for some accountability. You know, if you want something like that, you should have enough awareness or be open to learning what that would require of you. And that sort of holds holds the speaker in a little bit more tension and accountability. And look, lots of 10-year-olds want to play Major League Baseball, but almost none of them really know what that means to engage in that type of work. And so I can't say I had a perfect picture, but I could say that I had a pretty clear picture, especially relative to my peers as to what that would look like. So speaking of that, since you mentioned work ethic and all of that, I'm just curious about your family dynamics, right? It seems like you mm -hmm. and your dad had this sort of inside secret about your ambition in life. How did you view your dad's work ethic and his trajectory through your 10-year-old sort of eyes in relation to that? to what he was kind of suggesting to you in that moment or your mother's. It doesn't have to be exclusive to your yeah. dad. You know, I had still have the best parents. And I think it, many folks will say that, and you know, of course I'm biased, but you know, there was a great dynamic between my mom and my dad. So in those 10 year old eyes, my dad was more of the principled sort of authoritarian feeling figure who sort of reflected this blue collar mentality. You know, he was from Oregon, a real like logging, hardworking family, came from poverty, who sort of worked his way to what most Americans would, would call the dream. And my mom had a similar drive, you know, both of them were the siblings who moved away to California, you know, but my mom brought in these elements of creativity, art, travel, and there was this cool blend. And I think that there was this, thank goodness, this foundation in my household that I can't remember a day in my life where I didn't believe wholeheartedly that there was something that I couldn't do. And that belief was tethered directly to 
your effort and your attitude and your character. And so it just sort of like set the stage for these rules or understanding of life that had me believing that I could do anything. I would be supported in doing anything and that with enough hard work, I could accomplish it. And I think a lot of people can hear those sentiments and sort of nod in agreement, but it's one thing to agree with it. And it's another thing to actually believe it. And I, I knew that I would be loved unconditionally, regardless of the results, regardless of what I wanted to be when I grew up, et cetera. But I did feel a great deal of agency in that and responsibility in that to kind of make my reality. And, And that came directly from my parents. And so at that time in your life, had you already sort of mapped out your future, your career in baseball? I'm going to finish school, go to college for a few years, and then get drafted and work my way up and all of that? Yeah. And it was clear as day at a, again, I I use that word kind of in jest, but at an inappropriately young age, I had it all mapped out, including, and this isn't like a backup plan, but including the vision beyond baseball. You know, I, I... decided at it. I don't know if it was that exact age, but shortly thereafter that I wanted to be an entrepreneur after baseball. I assumed I'd be like (laughs) in my late forties or something like that. (laughs) You know, that, that too was modeled to me, you know, the, the most successful people that I observed growing up weren't doctors or lawyers. They were high school dropouts who created something from nothing and it just reinforced this this vision after after sport was over you know mm-hmm. what was your main motivation was it winning was it money was it being a champion at that point you know what i'm a competitor however i i can't say that the prime focus was like chasing the feeling of winning i think a younger version of me was attracted to absolutely attracted to the superficial parts of what it would mean to be a major league baseball player. But I really was fascinated with the process of getting better. And I think that really served me because I've stood literally side by side with players, a handful specifically who played, we played together at the high school level, the college level and the professional level who I, you know, not to be disparaging, but I will say, unequivocally had a different experience of that progression than they did, meaning sort of coming out on the other end of it with a lot more tools and insights as to what it is that we went through. And I think that's because the whole time, you know, starting at age, whatever, eight, nine, 10, the process of getting better was my obsession beyond just the result of being a better baseball player, but how that worked. Like, how do these systems of development work? One, as an individual, and then two, as a a team or an organization. And so I think I was like, I know that I was sort of displacing my awareness at a really young age, meaning I was in the room as a player trying to get better, but I was also often placing my mind in the perspective of the coach as to like how it is you could affect change on this group? How could you orient the norms and the rules of this group to get more positive outcomes or win more baseball games? You know, and so the real attraction to me wasn't beating other people in a game or making a bunch of money. It was sort of, it quickly became that baseball was the context or the container to learn about development. And it was so, it's, it's such a skill based sport that it's, it's a great place to do that. You know, like not again, like there are such rich skill development opportunities in, in all sports, but I was v- not athletic. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not athletic by sort of nature and, you know, slow. I'm kind of tall, but I played a position where that didn't really serve me. Wasn't naturally strong. But the specifics of baseball are such that, you know, you don't need to be an athlete necessarily to be great at the sport. And so the scales of talent versus like skill development are are pretty heavily weighted 
at least in baseball more than other sports, towards skill development. And that's what really fascinated me. And speaking of which, you had a, a pretty monumental run-in with an L.A. Dodger, Mike Davis. And that's oh, where yeah. you kind of acquired a mantra that you used throughout your the rest of your baseball career. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and the mantra that you learned from him? Yeah. So my, my little league field, which is still there over in Playa del Rey, down by the lagoon, my dad and some of the other parents organized a little uh, clinic. And in the clinic, the coaches were current and former major league players and coaches, you know, people with real experience. And I remember at that age, up until that point, the major leagues felt very far away and unrelatable. And there is a significant power, more than I expected, in seeing a major league type individual up close and personal in uniform. And so there was a moment where Mike Davis, you know, he's walking out in his Dodger uniform to sort of address the the group of kids and we're sitting around and kind of like a half circle. And he shares this quote, and it's not his quote, but it's sort of misattributed a bunch, but it goes like this. He says, good, better, best. Never let it rest until the good becomes the better and the better becomes the best. And that landed on my ears at an age where I was already aware that I was going to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish by practicing more and practicing better than my peers. But to see the guy in the uniform sort of reconfirm that at the time, it felt like all I needed. And so what you're sort of making reference to is that mantra stayed with me because I I wrote it in every hat that I wore. And then later, you know, when you get the fancy professional leather belt, you know, I was writing them inside the my belt. And I still have stuff here with, with that written everywhere. And, and that just really sort of solidified this idea of process. You play uh, catcher? Yeah, catcher. Why catcher? Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics of how people choose a position and, and, and why you played the position you played in baseball? Yeah, of course. I mean, early on, there are some premium positions. And at, at a younger age, shortstop and pitcher are like where the best players go. And I played some shortstop and I played some pitcher. But at actually that same exact age, age 10, I was at just a little league practice. And I learned the first unique value of the catcher's position, which is the coach was asking if anyone had interest in trying the position. And because there's all this equipment involved and your sort of normal ready state position is crouched in the bottom of the squat, almost none of the kids want to do it. And so I opted to do it. And I immediately fell in love with the engagement in the game. It's a natural position of leadership. You're the only player facing the defense. And so you're later in my career, you'd end up dealing with uh, the pitching staff. There's a lot of communication that happens there and then communication with the defense. And so I think there was a reinforced loop there that at a young age, I was one of the better players that was choosing a position that was sort of more rare for like a a better player, at least at like the little little league level. And, you know, that really served me later. It's a highly technical position. And I really embrace like that leadership side. Uh, You're working hard all day. It's sort of this non-glamorous thing. And to be super meta to my personality, there's a thing that they say about catchers that is something we can also say about referees and umpires (laughs) is that, to be a great catcher is to go unnoticed. You know, when you notice mm. the catcher, the ball's, get, <laughs> the ball's getting by, something wrong is happening. You know, when you notice the referees, it's not, it's not good, right? And so I liked having this role of leadership and working hard and being highly technical and also not needing to be the center of attention. Is there anything mechanically about playing the position of catcher that would it give you an, a, an unfair advantage that people wouldn't necessarily think about? Well, I am tall, almost tall in a prohibitive way for the, the position. So I'm a 6'3", and it sort of pays to be a little bit shorter. Mm-hmm. But there is a very specific skill 
with catching and scouts would call it like catch and throw ability. One is mm-hmm. like receiving, basically making pitches look good. That's the kind of silent part of the job. I became quite good at that. But then there's this number and it's one of the only numbers in baseball, specifically on the defensive level, that is sort of like your passport to the highest levels of the sport. So in the NFL, for example, most folks who are a fan of any level recognize the 40 yard dash, right? And, Mm -hmm. and if you go to the combine and if you run a four, three or a four, four, 40, you're going to get a job that's sort of guaranteed. Similarly in baseball, at least at the younger ages, if you can throw north of 90 miles an hour, you're going to get a look as a pitcher. But as the catcher, there's a very specific number called your pop time. And that's the time on a stopwatch between when the ball touches your glove Mm -hmm. and the ball touches the glove of whoever is covering second base in like a stolen base scenario. Mm. And that pop time is sort of like the catcher's 40-yard dash. Mm. And I sort of reverse engineered that. And I think this is maybe helpful in in general in life. But when there are certain metrics like that that would indicate a bigger story or value, you can sort of reverse engineer how to accomplish it. And so Major League Average is 1.95 seconds from the moment the ball touches the catcher's glove to the glove of the person covering second base. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the scouting of catchers comes down to checking and recording this time. And I knew that if I could get a remarkable pop time and that I could show up to showcases and between innings and when people try to steal a base, if I could demonstrate for whomever is watching that I could have a pop time better than major league average, then I sort of have given myself a job. And so I made that a quest. I worked at that so specifically to achieve that time that it gave me a very specific goal to zone in on. And I live here just a few doors down from the gym here in in Venice. And at the end of my street is coincidentally the park that my high school baseball team played at. And I remember going there after must have been my sophomore year of high school, after sort of training this for maybe a year and a half without really testing it under a stopwatch. And like today was going to be the first day of trying it. And I remember in my first attempts to record this time, I recorded a 1.88 second pop time. (laughs) And it was like in that moment, you know, I mean, no, no other major league teams were there. It was just like the, the high school team. But it was in that moment that I really felt that this was real and mm. that I was going to be a professional baseball player. And it would, you know, it would take, what is that, seven more years until I was drafted. But I knew that this was happening. And mm-hmm. so that's a very kind of like specific skill that I think most people wouldn't, wouldn't know about. Mm. Love that. <laughs> yeah. And who was the Michael Jordan of catchers at the time? Pudge Rodriguez, Ivan Rodriguez was kind of the player. There was also is Pud- another player. Pud- is Pudge a nickname or is that his actual Pudge name? is a nickname, yeah. Pudge is okay. a nickname, but Ivan Rodriguez is his name. He was probably the best player at the time. Just before him, maybe the first contemporary, I'll say, contemporary catcher to really glamorize the defensive position was a guy called Benito Santiago. Mm-hmm. His manager was my first manager in the Padre system, a guy called Greg Riddock. And he would tell me stories years later about him. But he was the guy that was able to make that throw I just described, but from his knees and do kind of amazing things defensively. And so, you know, I didn't really have a favorite player, but I did respect and I wanted to glamorize the defensive part of the position. And I think a lot of that was my distaste because right around the same time, you know, Los Angeles had a a Hall of Fame catcher named Mike Piazza. And he was a Hall of Famer because he could hit better than any catcher maybe ever, but didn't really exceed average behind the plate. And so I wanted to really 
honor this position and, and do the defensive part well. Right. Okay. So you're at Santa Monica Catholic High School. You're playing ball for those guys. What was your mindset, your mentality at the time, just in life in general? Did you feel optimistic? Do you have any kind of like mental health stuff happening? What was happening inside of the mind? For me, n- nothing negative or mental health wise came up until years later, maybe like three, four years ago for me. But at the time, I felt like I was on this straight path to my sort of wildest dreams, basically. I mean, I I can vividly remember, I just got back from a trip playing internationally. I was on this national team that played in Australia, New Zealand, doing this like tour. And, you know, one of the local papers interviewed me about it. And I said in the paper that they asked me about my goals. Meanwhile, I'm a freshman going into my freshman year in high school. And I told this reporter that I was going to play at Stanford University. But that was if I didn't get drafted, you know, right out of high school. Mm-hmm. And which is like maybe like an audacious thing to say, but that I, I genuinely believe that. Mm-hmm. And then one of the deans of my high school found the article or read the article and posted it up in the bulletin board of my uh, high school lobby, which I was kind of embarrassing. I didn't like that kind of attention, you know, and I remember literally being in that hallway as a freshman and I only mildly knew some of the varsity players uh, meeting them the previous summer. And one of the seniors ran past my locker, like made it known that he was going to like check out this article because folks had been talking about it. And he, I watched him from down the hall, read the article and he's got his like hands on his head and he was just like blown away. Um, He was like trying to make fun of me, you know, that Mm -hmm. I would say something like that. And I remember the next year I made varsity my freshman year. And I just remember the next year that there was a moment that one of the better players on the team, upperclassmen, sort of validated that moment. It was like, remember when y'all like laughed at him about this thing? And they felt like it was going to be real, you know? And so I didn't really feel any doubt or negativity or I guess I was just, I think if I spoke what I believed about myself, that I would be viewed as arrogant and I think people would be surprised. But it was just like positivity and, and confidence, I think. And tell us, what was the next phase like? You obviously went to college down in San yeah. Diego. Yeah, I went to college. The recruiting process was sort of interesting. You know, I really, I think I liked the idea of being drafted out of high school for like, I don't know, teenage bravado reasons. But I was a student, you know, I had like a GPA well over 4.0 in high school. And unless the money was crazy, I, I was going to go to college, you know. But I liked the idea of talking to scouts as a senior while I'm, you know, doing my homework. And that felt sexy and cool. It felt cool to talk with an agent and those things. But, you know, it's worth mentioning the other side of the the story a bit is I say this half jokingly, but it's like I've never accomplished any of my goals. You know, I I, <laughs> me- I mentioned that I was gonna play at Stanford, you know. I went on a recruiting trip up to Stanford. Uh, with my one of my best friends at the time, Randy Molina. And I was on crutches because I tore my ankle, ligaments my ankle. And one of us came back from that trip with a scholarship offer and it wasn't me, you know. Mm. And uh, and then I changed my mind, you know. I, I saw that this guy called Mike Nikias, who I bumped into the other day, he's an agent for CAA, was a, a local catcher who was the starting catcher at Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech was playing in the College World Series every year. And I was I was watching uh, him catch on ESPN and I said, there's a California kid catching there. That's what I'll do. So I'm going to, I'm going to play at Georgia Tech. And so then I went on a recruiting trip my junior year there and met with the, the re- recruiting coordinator. And then I got home and in a follow up email to him, I, I said, Hey, so, you know, what do you think? How's it look for me coming to Georgia Tech? And he said, I'll never forget. He goes, Logan, you're absolutely a division one catcher, but, uh, we're going to, sign this kid here in Georgia. And I was so arrogant at the time that I was like, who is in Georgia? You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm the best catcher available, all these things that I thought in my head. And and he was referencing a future major league all-star Matt leaders, (laughs) (laughs) maybe the, 
one of the best two way players in college history, you know? And so constantly I just sort of shot for the stars and got like cut down a bit was my, was my interpretation of it in a lot of ways. And, and I'm super blessed though, that I chose to go to the university of San Diego. It was the smallest scholarship offer I ever received. And I fear who I would have become if I went to any other program, the group that we had there, the culture that we had there, the, what we were, were able to accomplish there is such a strong part of my life, my development that I wouldn't wish it any other way. Mm -hmm. So on these, in these stories, I talk a lot about breadcrumbs leading you to your path and also some of the angels, meaning just the people, the Obi-Wan Kenobis, the people who step in and mentor you. Sounds like you've had a few of those at this point in your life. I'm sure some of your coaches and managers in high school and college can qualify in that role, but you also met a woman named Kara Miller in college. Yeah, that's right. I knew I went to, to study in the business school there at the University of San Diego. However, I sort of had a little buffer, some extra credits from the honors courses I was taking in high school. And the amount of buffer that I had or sort of room in my schedule was exactly equal to the units required to graduate with a minor from the leadership school. And they built this leadership school at the University of San Diego, which at the time was pretty edgy. So I opted to do that instead of kind of fill my time with electives that wouldn't necessarily serve a bigger purpose. And as sort of fate would have it, the capstone course is called Leadership Seminar. You had to take last in order to graduate from the program. And so the spring of my senior year coincided with the first time in NCAA history that the NCAA started with a, a uniform start date, meaning that the, the NCAA baseball season would start on the same weekend for all universities. And the effort there was to take away an advantage that fair weather schools like San Diego had. I mean, historically, we would play the first weekend uh, of college, the college season at the end of January. Meanwhile, much of the country is under snow and, and all that. And so, we condensed the same 52 game schedule in much less time. And it just meant that attending class, specifically this class, was going to be prohibitive. And so I tried to go to the school and ask for some exceptions and maybe an independent study or another way to do it. But they were sort of unwilling to, to make amends. And it just seemed silly to come back to university for a fifth year. I was going to be playing professional baseball. It just, it was a bummer that I was going to not be able to finish this course because of something that was school related. Mm -hmm. And I failed and failed and failed trying to get this exception. And one of the days I went in to speak with the management, I passed by Dr. Miller's desk and I knew that she was the professor and she happened to be there. I sat down and asked if I could share this story with her. And uh, she said, yeah, like, you know, let me look into it. And all I got was an email from her a few days later saying that she would do an independent study with me. But at eight or 10 years later, she told me the, the full story, which is that she went back to the dean and really went to bat for me. You know, and she's like, if we didn't build this building for this type of individual, then I don't know who we built it for. And she stuck her neck out there and and she made a deal with me that she would teach me the course one on one if I brought her a California burrito to each meeting. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we had a deal. And that was that was insanely impactful, not just because the material was super timely and relevant to my interests and what I was doing on the field. But a high level college course is pretty intense when you're sitting at a desk and there's no place to hide, you know, so it was very powerful. I wonder what she saw in you that compelled her to go to bat for you and, and to do a one on one training. I'm sure she wasn't sitting around twiddling her thumbs, waiting for that kind of thing to happen. What, what do you suppose that was? Well, if I put myself in her position, I think one could understand being unmotivated by folks who are just marking time. This isn't just a school thing. I mean, lots of people are sort of just moving through life and they're getting um, 
credit for being in the room, right? But I was I was asking them to make this as hard as they wanted, but I wanted to finish this course and I wanted to do it well. And I think that hearing someone with desire to learn and a willingness is unfortunately rare sometimes. And I think if you're, I mean, I don't want to like project this on like other kids and make myself sound like great and others maybe not or whatever. But, you know, if you're teaching to a classroom of 20 or 30 students who are on the apathy scale, trending a little bit too hard towards apathy, and then you have someone who is more or less beating down your door to engage with the material, I think it sort of lights you up. You know, I feel that today as a coach, someone who really wants, it's very difficult to say no to people who are genuinely willing in that way. Well, adding to that, I think a lot of times when you hear about college athletes, you kind of envision them as people who don't go to class, who kind of mail it in, they get people to do their assignments for them and all of that. And here you are, this athlete at the college who's actually wanting to show up. And, and that must have been, I, I imagine that must have been very unique for her to encounter someone like like you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, again, to speak very specifically to that school, yeah, I think you can imagine that, that it attracted a lot of athletes, you know, and it attracted a lot of athletes that thought they were getting into something a little bit more relaxed than it was, you know? And so th- I think there was some contrast there. What did you learn from that? that you didn't know before? That course was my first, obviously, introduction to Dr. Miller, who is a pretty profound teacher, consultant, thinker in in the space of leadership and group dynamics. That was the first course where it wasn't about playing the game of school. And I'll be honest with you, I was and am down to play the game, right? Like I'm not, I wasn't one of the kids that was in high school saying like, when am I ever going to use algebra and use that as a reason to protest doing my algebra homework? Mm-hmm. I sort of viewed it as like, someone has decided that this is the course we're all going to take. And if you tell me how to win the game, I'm going to win the game. And to do anything other than that seems like I'm only hurting myself, you know? And so a lot of students play the game, not for the sake of like getting something out of it, but just to play the game. And that was the first course that it wasn't about the game. Sure. Like at the end, she had to award me like a grade or something like that. But, you know, to this day, Kara is a notorious challenger of assumptions. She is a mirror to her students and the people that she works with. And so it was like a really introspective, challenging course because it was it was breaking a lot of frames and assumptions that I had about school and the sort of norms around what that ought to look like. And I had to show up with my A game, you know. I mean, quite honestly, it was the first time that I had to do I had to read the books. You know, <laughs> I could win school without doing the extra stuff. But when I'm going to sit down with a college professor face to face and there's no other person in the room to discuss the implications of a text, you know, you got to you got to show up for it, not to get the homework grade or to pass the quiz, but to have a conversation with someone who's sitting in front of you expecting you to engage with the material. So we'll look back around to Dr. Miller later, but talk a little bit about the draft process and and moving into the the pros. It feels to me almost semi-tragic. You know, I was in high school, you know, the eligibility goes like this. You're eligible for the Major League Baseball first year player draft at the end of your high school year. Mm -hmm. And then if you enroll at a four-year school, you're eligible again after your junior year. And then of course, after your senior year. And in high school, you know, I'm like on the phone talking to the Tampa Bay Rays about how much money it would take for me to skip college and all these exciting things. And then my junior year, I went undrafted. I had a sort of okay year. And then my senior year, you know, I hit a bunch of home runs, but I didn't do better. The team accomplished remarkable things and it felt great to be a part of that. But, you know, I didn't make myself a a household name in the in the draft process. So I got drafted really late. You know, I remember on draft days sitting at home hearing all the names go by and and wondering if I was even going to get selected. 
And mm-hmm. so I was selected by the San Diego Padres, a team that I had zero conversations with. And I just felt grateful at that time because I sort of had this moment where I was like, maybe this isn't going to happen. And then mm-hmm. the transition into professional baseball is it's hard to devote that much of your life to something and for it to be anything other than a dream. And no one wants to hear this, but it's not, you know, it's it's just not what people would want you to describe it as. And now I can say fully that I loved the memories that I made and I'm so grateful to have that chance. And many people don't have a chance to experience any of it, but to integrate the whole story on it is, you know, professional baseball is a pretty brutal lifestyle that is generally unhealthy and difficult and not nearly as glamorous as you would hope it to be. And I just remember towards the end of my first season, I was in Eugene, Oregon, playing for a mm-hmm. team called the Emeralds. And I was warming up on the on the side of the outfield foul line. And I looked across the field at the opponents and I kind of had this reflective moment and I thought, my goodness, I wanted to be here after high school and I would have been here this whole time and I would have missed that whole college experience that I that I had. And I felt afraid of again who I would have been if I took that that right. opportunity. And thank goodness that, you know, I went to college not just for like the education sake, I'm almost 0% of me is talking about having a diploma, but it's more of like, where are you going to spend your 18, 19, 20, 21st and you know, 22nd year old years and on those buses in those hotels seems like maybe not the best place. Right. And you mentioned something in your book, you said something, I can't remember the full quote, but you said in the pros, all they want is for you to be grateful or something along those lines. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, I'm sort of making reference to what it's like to come home and it's difficult to come home and be like the one who is quote unquote living the dream. Mm-hmm. And just sort of mathematically you're you're mostly engaging with people who aren't. And it's just not really the time or the place to share with those people that you experience some struggle or that you maybe you don't like parts of it or that you have anything negative to say, you know? And so, yeah, it just felt that type of thinking and communication was was sort of unwelcome. And that's a lot of what is behind the impetus of the book, which is a little bit of this idea that I believe we all want to realize our potential and see what's behind our best efforts. And most people are not engaging in that kind of behavior. But when they see someone doing it, there's an attraction there. And they want to sort of live through that or be tangent to that. And I could definitely feel a palpable thing amongst my peers and the parents of my peers when I came home that first season of like, see, like he's doing it. And they didn't want me to taint that for them maybe. Mm -hmm. And when did you, uh, you got that phone call from the organization. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, I got let go, released at the very end of my second year. At the time I was in the California league playing in, uh, high A with a team called the Lake Elsinore Storm. And it was an off day, which is like you get an off day like every 40 days or something like that. And I was driving with a teammate from Lake Elsinore to Cal State Fullerton to do a Nike photo shoot of all things. I was just on the freeway and I got a call and I answered it. And uh, it was the manager saying, uh, we got to let you go. You know, Padres no longer need your services and it was pretty transactional and that was it. And I hung up and then I just kept driving and, and it was sort of surreal. I mean, I, I didn't have any emotions that, that were like, I was, this was an injustice or I was being mistreated. Like I agreed with their decision, but it felt, yeah, it felt very surreal and I wasn't emotional yet. I sort of packed up my stuff and I, and I you know, I kind of went home and I reflected and I, and I think the thing that was emotional for me was 
I entertained some conversations from other teams about signing another deal, a minor league deal. And remember, you know, from the original story about being a catcher is the position is a premium position because uh, it's very highly skilled and, and very few people are willing to do it. And so, quite frankly, it's much easier to have a job if you're a catcher than other positions for that reason. And so I just knew that signing another deal was not, it wasn't the organization's interest to make me their next major league catcher. And so I think in my heart of hearts, I knew that whole off season that I was done. Before the call? No, after the call, I mean, not going to re-sign done, right? But, but how I was living my life, I was still working out and training. And I think all the people around me were either too afraid to ask or assumed that I would re-sign and continue with my career. But in my heart, I knew that I was done. And I remember telling my parents, it was the morning of Thanksgiving. And I just remember telling them that that, that that would be it. And I cried and yeah, it was, you know, I'll never forget it. It was really hard to tell them that. How did they respond? They unconditionally loved and, and supported me. And I felt that immediately, you know, I think they were mostly concerned with me and what I needed and what I felt. And I think that it felt heavy to them because they observed someone, their son, engage with a certain level of desire and attention to detail, you know, and making sacrifices and just living your life in a very specific type of way for so long. And I think they were sort of, they were in, in observation of me. It's kind of like when the, the baby trips and falls and everybody's waiting to see if like the, the baby's going to cry or not, you know, mm. is he hurt? And mm -hmm. it just felt very supportive. Did you have any idea what you would do if the baseball thing didn't work out prior to you being let go? Did you, have any, did you ever have that conversation with yourself? Zero. Not one concept. I knew generally, however, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, I knew specifically that I set a goal. I was like an anti-goal to never make a resume, you know? And so I just wanted to to make a company from nothing and do that. And the details of the company almost didn't matter. I mean, that brainstorming process began with a former teammate of mine, one of my best friends in the world. He's a scout with the Los Angeles Angels where we, you know, our, our first idea was to do this fire protection company. <laughs> we we're going to offer all these different fire protection services for buildings and homeowners associations and things like that. And uh, so random, you know, it was his idea, but I didn't care. You know, I, I was attracted to the development entrepreneurially more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until later that the strength and conditioning conversation came up, but no, I had no idea. And I felt oddly okay with that. Right. And how much money did you have at the time? Did you have anything saved up or what was your financial oh, no, situation no money. Like? Oh, no money for sure. <laughs> um, I had like my parents had a few thousand dollars in like a college fund. I don't know if it was like eight or ten thousand dollars or something like that that we didn't use. So I had that and I didn't really kind of tap into that until later 2013 when the, the gym moved from the park to the gym facility. But no, I was living on credit cards and no money. I mean, yeah. Okay, so you get the call, you tell your parents, now what? I had this period of my life that I don't know why it happened. It wasn't very calculated, but I went so inward. I was staying at my parents' house at the time. This is when I first started drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and I read three books at a time for months. I was painting. I was going by canvases and paint. I was writing. And it was this creative, introspective time. And, and what it sort of felt like was having just ultimate freedom after living a pretty structured, disciplined life. And I remember splitting my life into like three categories. And this is really at the heart of what I observed and would later be the reason for writing the book was on paper, I should have been, I think, fearful about the uncertainty. I was technically 
completely unprepared for whatever was coming next because whatever was coming next had nothing to do with pop times and hitting a baseball. But I knew so clearly in my mind that if I put the energy that I put into that sport specifically into three categories generally that it wouldn't matter. I don't even need to know the details, but that the person that I would be would be so undeniable is what I believed. And those three categories was was my physical competency, my intellectual competency, and my spiritual competency. And so I just went for it in a very general way without knowing any specifics. And it was just such an important time to figure out like who I was and what are some of the things that I believe in and can I articulate those and how can I manifest something valuable in, in the world, you know? And it ended up looking like opening gyms. But at the time, I, I didn't have any specifics. And, and I also didn't care or worry that I didn't have specifics. Now, leading up to this, you had a whole series of coaches and managers and Dr. Miller and all these people. Now that that phase of your life was over with or transitioned, who did you see as sort of your mentor into entrepreneurship? Or maybe was it a book or some video that you had seen? Well, in the very back of my mind, the models I had growing up were two people, a guy called Jim Argyropoulos, who started what later became Cherokee Shoes, which later became the licensed clothing company Cherokee. And he was a high school dropout that my dad was his first hire and he built a couple hundred million dollar company out of his garage and a guy called Greg Games, who was my dad's best friend, who also a high school dropout who had a multi-million dollar tile company. So in the back of my mind, I had this this view of entrepreneurship that was of responsibility, opportunity, upside. It was very expansive and egalitarian. I really appreciated all of the, the things that I saw modeled there. But specifically, when I was getting this business plan in my mind together about a, a fitness school for general people and treating them like athletes... I went to my college strength coach while I was living down in San Diego and I asked him who could I learn from when I moved back to Los Angeles. I wanted to live in Los Angeles where I was from and he sent me to this guy called Andy Petronic. And Andy Petronic uh, was a successful coach and then gym owner in Santa Monica who coincidentally opened what was the ninth ever CrossFit affiliate. And it just so happened that he was the perfect model to learn from. I interned with him because he had a view of fitness or strength and conditioning that was absolutely rigorous in its being technically sound training, mm -hmm. but transcended that. And it was a real business. I mean, most folks at that time in the sort of micro gym space were running a passion project and this guy had a real vision for a real business. And so thankfully I landed on that doorstep rather than someone's side hustles doorstep. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did you learn? What is, what's like the main thing you learned from working with Andy? I mean, so much, but the main thing worth mentioning was he was the first person that was doing what I think is critically important to what we do now, which was he understood that fitness is free. And if it's not free, it's mostly free. And that if you are trying to sell that, it's going to be really difficult to win and it's going to be nearly impossible to create a lot of value. But he was clearly articulating to the market that he was selling coaching mm. and coaching is of a different value and it is maybe more important and definitely has the opportunity to accomplish more good in the fitness industry, in my opinion. And he was making that explicitly clear, changing the minds of the consumer who inquired about his business right? Said, oh, the thing that you want? Absolutely. We have that. Also, that's not why you pay us money. You pay us money for this other thing. And that changed the worldview of the folks that he worked with. And that was 
critically still is critically important to what I do today. Is that when you got involved in strongman competitions and stuff like that at Andy's gym? So that was slightly before. I got involved with strongman a few years after because I was gifted the strongman trainer course and sort of I thought it was just going to be like a fun Saturday doing what my biased view of training looked like, which is just the shorter, heavier bouts. And I couldn't unknow or unlearn what it is that I saw there, which is that surprisingly, the implements and movement patterns inside of this obscure strength sport of strongman, if you Mm -hmm. understand it well, are potentially as good or better in many cases for developing general physical preparedness in a broad population of people than a lot of the tools that were being accepted there. You know, uh, higher skilled gymnastics and weightlifting were sort of blessed as being deemed worthy to teach a general population of people functional movement. Mm -hmm. But there was still a stigma with regards to loading atlas stones and carrying kegs and flipping tires. And so I felt that I too could communicate that message quite effectively to the general population. And so I ended up teaching that seminar all around the world, been to 10 or 11 countries teaching strongman to folks who have almost no interest in competing in the sport. You know, and so that became a, uh, integrated into sort of my worldview of movement. And and had you already started training in the park at that point? Yeah, that was right about the same time. And this was so 2011, April 12th, 2011 was the first day in the park pretending to, to create a gym. Who did you train in the park? How did you get these clients? <laughs> How did yeah. people find out about you? So I met a guy called Danny Leslie while I was interning with Andy. And I think that the way I remember it is that I think he just had like a a tougher day. He was personal training mostly through a, a corporate gym locally. And I think he had like a, a tougher day. You know, it's it's that day that every trainer realizes that, all right, wait a second. I charge this much an hour and there's only this many hours in the day and okay, this is not scalable, right? And so I think he was like, hey, man, I got to do something different. I want to create a space and open gym and all that. And I said, man, I'm that's what I'm here to do as well. You know, like, what do you think? And so he's like, well, I was thinking about taking some of my personal training clients up to the park and training them in, in a group, like a small class. And so that's what we did. And there were, you know, a little, little boom box and some beach towels and mismatch of equipment and uh yeah we we sort of showed up and tried to convince anybody who would listen that, that we had a legitimate training facility so you had a what kind of car did you have at the time <laughs> i had a chevy colorado it was a pickup truck okay and he had a he had a big old i think a ford you know f-150 or something like that and over the years we ended up having just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of plates and barbells and kettlebells in the back of our trucks. I think we ruined our brakes and our shocks were all shot. (laughs) (laughs) Did you have permit issues? Did the cops ever come up to you guys and say, hey, you you can't be out here training people? We were were permitted the whole time. And so that part was fine. And the uh, any of the cops that would come up were were mostly friends or things like that. But you know, I find that fitness is quite emotionally charged. And so there was absolutely a small population of very passionate Santa Monica residents that didn't like the idea that we were training in the park. And so just as we transitioned to a brick and mortar location in Venice, the first location for Deuce, Santa Monica outlawed fitness in that park and sort of legislated some aggressive anti-fitness policy. (laughs) Was that because of you? You guys? Uh, We definitely didn't help. I'll say that. (laughs) But we were definitely not the only people out there. I mean, the park was was in use, you know. I'll I'll say that. And there are lots of trainers and different classes and things happening out there. But we, yeah, we definitely didn't help. So when you were training in the park, I'm assuming that that's the time you were sort of developing the what would become the hold the standard deuce sort of 
philosophy. Can you talk a little bit about the genesis of, of that? Yeah, the motto, hold the standard, is very simply is this notion that, you know, we wanted the gym deuce to represent idealism, like the place where you went and just being inside of it made you feel like, ah, oh, I need to transcend myself. I need to play up. I need to be on my, my best A game. And the more nuanced explanation, and this sort of leads into what I teach now in my seminar with adaptive leadership and organizational culture is that hold the standard is often misunderstood. I think if you look at that, you're sort of thinking, okay, this is this thing that looks cool on a t-shirt that represents like we're the best or something like that. When in reality, inside of those three words is a endless developmental process. And it's based on what we observe in human behavior and also what we see in the literature, which is that the standard is like the vision. It's idealism. It's perfection. It's the target. And how any sort of process of development works is that is the image we have in our mind that we are trying to mimic, mm -hmm. right? Like, like light, if you give a talk, you, before you give that talk, you have an image in your head that is how you would like it to go, right? How you'd mm -hmm. like it to feel. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you give the talk or you give your effort and then you start to notice the differences between the perfect thing you were trying to mimic and what it is that actually happened. And that space is the space that we say leaders occupy. They take responsibility for that space. They hold that space. They hold the standard. And engaging in that gap and being curious about how to shorten the space between reality, where we are, and idealism, where we're trying to go, is the process that sort of never ends. And so... In many ways, we're trying to build this perpetual motion machine of development that we are always getting better until forever. And I think Hold the Standard really embodies that. Did you trademark that or how did you, how did yes, you come I up did. with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about that is, uh, yes, I did trademark that. And in the trademark process, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I, I have. Yeah. Yeah. It, it like, you know, it takes a little second. And I was listening to a Tim Ferriss podcast one day while this thing was pending and he had a chef on. I don't remember the chef's name, but you know, it's back there in the log or something years ago now. And the chef answered a question from Tim Ferriss that was something like, how do you discipline your sous chefs? You know, like, are you hard on them? Are you nice? What's, what's your style? And the chef said something sort of more or less like, I'm not too much of a, an authoritarian, but there's this feeling that there's a certain standard in my kitchen and that you must hold the standard. And then Tim, and I'm freaking out because I'm hearing this <laughs> thing. And then Tim Ferriss goes, that sounds good. You should put that on a shirt. Hold the standard. And then I go... And I immediately go to my phone and I email the lawyer and I go, any updates, you know? <laughs> and you got registered. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. That's, that's thank pretty you. huge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So had the name Deuce already been chosen at that point? Deuce, yeah. It was chosen sort of just before the Hold the Standard motto came about. While you were in the park? No, no. That, that came later. The building that we leased came first. And, you know, I sort of researched the building and long, long, long story made shorter. It's an old garage and that garage has been there for over a hundred years. And there was a Grand Prix race that was supposed to be held in Santa Monica in the year 1915, believe it or not. And Santa Monica canceled the event a few months before the event. And the complaints of the residents sounded a lot like the complaints of people working out in the park. You know, mm -hmm. this is unsafe. This is a bad look for the neighborhood. We don't want this here. Same thing happened with the race. And then the founder of Venice, a guy called a Abbott Kinney, offered to host the race in Venice. And the racetrack went right in front of our gym on Lincoln 
and we have a photo of the the guy who won the race. And so Deuce is the number on the side of the race car, and we wanted to embody that sort of vintage racing theme with a subtle sort of jab towards our new home in Venice. Uh, The event was like very impactful for the community and a positive event that was supposed to be in Santa Monica, just like we were. You also mentioned before in another interview that you purposely wanted a name that didn't have anything to do with working out. Yeah, the name Deuce, the brainstorming process is actually uh, Lindsay and I in Austin in a bar. We're trying to think of names. And the brainstorm process began with some criteria that the name would not describe what it is and that it would be a one syllable word. And Deuce was sort of it. We figured that there was this number associated with it, one syllable word, had a bit of like a, you know, you could hold up a peace sign and kind of claim it. You know, these were sort of the, the thoughts. And the reason for that is that fitness is is such a charged environment that everyone has strong opinions. You know, if I say something to you like Pilates, or if I say CrossFit, or if I say yoga, any listener sort of starts filling in the story there. And because fitness is so charged, it's often a very opinionated story. And so I wanted an opportunity for us to educate the consumer as to what it is that we were. And if you drove by a sign that said Venice CrossFit or Venice Pilates, a lot of the drivers or the passersby would maybe not give us a chance to educate them as to what it is that we did inside of those walls. And so I think what I've been doing for the past eight years or so is trying to educate the world what deuce means. And I think for the folks that are semi-aware of it, it means something quite remarkable. So you guys were in the park for a few years training. I'm assuming that you and Danny got to a point where you realized, hey, we have enough people. If we wanted to open up a brick and mortar, we could. And then it sounds like the whole park city council thing that happened kind of forced your hand. Was that a tough leap to make or was that a more of an organic like, okay, we're going to do it anyway. So now is the time. Let's go ahead and and try to find a space and et cetera. It wasn't tough out of sheer ignorance. (laughs) Naivety. (laughs) Yeah. Which I, I mentioned in the book, the hiding hand principle. It's like, this is to our advantage. You know, like I think there's a false notion Gladwell talks about it in, I think, Blink or whatever, the false notion that more information is always better, you know? And it's like, if we really went to the whiteboard and broke out the pie charts and dialed in all the predictive metrics, you know, and consulted with a bunch of other people's opinions, we would have found a lot of great reasons not to make that leap. And the the hiding hand principle is sort of the classic example is... um, folks digging a mine shaft you know it's like there's a certain amount of planning what's the budget how many man hours how difficult is this going to be to sort of bore this hole two miles into the side of this mountain and then you start and then two months in six months in you have more information than when you started and you're a little bit dirtier than when you started and you're more tired and you're you have less money but you've started and it, you can't go back now. So you keep digging further and it takes longer than you thought, costs more money than you thought, et cetera, et cetera. And if you would have had that information to begin with, you would have maybe not done it in the first place. And so not having all that information allows us to, I think, engage in things that maybe we'd otherwise prevent ourselves from, you know, and I do the mental experiment all the time. It's like, I get the benefit of sitting right now with you in this conversation. And I can sort of say that at this moment, the story ends well, like it's successful. Like we can say that objectively. But if I were to put myself knowing what I know now, back at the beginning, mind you, I didn't have the opportunity to know that it would work out. It still feels pretty, it feels hard to go back out to the park for day one. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. it it Mm -hmm. makes me want to, it makes me want to puke to think about it. And I know that it ends up well. I didn't then. Right. 
I've used that uh, analogy of the staircase before. It's, you know, you can't see the end of the staircase. All you can see is the first 100 steps. So you think it's a 100 step process. But mm-hmm. once you get up to the 100 steps, you see there's actually a thousand step process. But if you, uh. if you saw the thousand steps, you probably wouldn't have even attempted to go the first 100 steps. So it's by design. That's exactly it. You talked in the book, Go Right, about how when you first found the spot, the garage, the classic just garage, you guys, you and Danny built it out yourself. And then mm-hmm. it was like a four month delay that you had not budgeted for. And uh, talk a little bit about how you dug yourself out of that hole with the watch. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, here's what I say knowing doesn't help. Like, knowing that adversity is coming and that you got to just get through it and like bear down. And this is what makes the story great in the end, like knowing doesn't change the fact that it is actually difficult and it actually hurts and it's actually challenging you. And I knew all the lessons about adversity and the willingness to work hard and whatever, but it was so difficult and it felt like sheer injustice. And I realized that that's relative. We're all having our own different experiences. But when you're sort of betting your whole life, all your money, all your time, on this thing and you're sort of being denied your ability to engage in in business because whatever the city planning department isn't open or that they're going to get to your permit when they want to, or they're going to deny you for this thing or that thing. It feels like you are experiencing injustice and you don't have control. And we were just kids with not a bunch of money. I mean, we had support, but extending out you know it's funny you say four months we've been in this covid thing for four months Mm. it gets very real and two things happen one is i'm i'm out of money i'm doing the thing at the grocery store where i pull out my wallet and i'm shuffling through my credit cards and i'm sort of keeping my fingers crossed for an overdraft protection notice rather than just a denied credit card. You know, like that's the state of my life where I'm like, okay, I want this to get approved. I'll probably get overdraft, but at least I can like check out here and I won't be sent home with no groceries. And so the most valuable thing that I owned at the time was a watch that my ex-girlfriend's mother bought me for graduation. It's this tag hewer watch. Like, you know, I watched her pay like 3000 bucks cash for it. I didn't, really feel like I needed a watch like that in my life to begin with. So I'm just driving around town to pawn shops, which I hear are places where you take stuff that are semi-valuable and you get cash for them. And no one wanted to buy this watch for anything respectable cash wise. And so a couple of people offered me a couple hundred bucks for it, but I ended up holding on to the watch. But that was sort of the level of, of desperation. And then I got what I thought was a break. And I, uh, I went to my parents and I said, you know, that woman that lived next to us growing up, Linda, this is an old woman who I would just, you know, climb her, her wall and get my baseball out of the backyard every now and then <clears throat> sit with her. She bought me some bonds as a kid. I didn't know how many or of what value, but I knew that I had these bonds that I was supposed to use for college. And I said, you know, mom, can you send me those? And so she sent out the envelope and I took it right over to Wells Fargo over there in Santa Monica. And I plopped it on the counter and I said, Hey, I want to cash these bonds. And they said, great, take a seat over there. We'll come out with the information in a second. And I was sitting in the chair and this woman comes out and she's holding a receipt uh, with a number underlined on it. And it said $7,723. And I was blown away. I was like, we're in business. Like (laughs) we are golden. Like we were dead. Now we're alive. This is amazing. And I go, are you serious? And she's like, yeah, I'm serious. We double checked. We'll have the, the cash in your account by the end of the day. And I'm like, oh my God. So I get in my car. I could have drove home a hundred miles an hour. I was so happy. I immediately go in and spend $7,725 or $23 at roguefitness.com to get the equipment that we needed to finish opening the gym. And two days later, I get a call from Wells Fargo about a clerical error that the number was in fact $772.30 and that a decimal place got moved over. And I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. 
that that happened. I can get, <laughs> I can I can get you the money back. I just need some time. Uh, I've spent it, and they said, "Oh, uh, we're not really interested in what you did with the money. We need the money back in your account." And they were brutal to me, calling me from different branches, or whatever, threatening to cancel all my accounts and all these things. And they needed the money in there like yesterday. And so it was so par for the course in that moment that I was like, this thing is going to make me bleed. And now I get to joke about it. But what did you end up? How did you get that money to them? I had to take out a loan from a friend, you know, and so thank goodness for those folks. Awesome. And how did you, what was the first day like when you guys opened? First day was incredible. And I think that the thing worth mentioning here is sort of what we talked about earlier there is a natural human attraction to people who are vulnerably going for it is maybe the most simple way to say it. And people observed us in the park for literally two and a half years. And the arc of that experience, if I'm to like personify the perception of it was sort of like, Oh my God, that's, that's cute. They're like doing a thing in the park. And then it was like, Oh yeah, they're still doing that that thing in the park. And then that thing in the park looks pretty cool. And then, man, they got a lot of people out there in the park. And then, dude, they're killing it. Like I we should go out to the park. And then <laughs> <laughs> and then the gym space opened and it was like, you won't believe it. They did it. Like they're opening this place. It's right over there. You can see it with your own two eyes. I cannot believe it. They did it. And so it was this like communal celebration of a vulnerable effort. And we started with a sort of critical mass of students and that really helped us, you know, but I'll never forget. I mean, that was really helpful and I wish more gyms started that way these days, but I'll never forget our first non park members. This guy called Monty Freeman, him and Brett, they drove up together they were going to the store and they pull up and they said, Hey, so what do y'all, uh, what do y'all do here? We want to, how do you join the gym? And I was, you know, running around with it like a chicken with his head cut off. And I was realizing in that moment that this was a, allegedly a real business and that I had to have something to say to this guy. <laughs> and so <laughs> my words were sort of like, well, you know, uh, normally what, what we do in situations like this is, uh, you know, normally I'll just, I'll have you come inside and this is me just making this up as I go. And, uh, we signed up our first member and people kept coming and thank God for just figuring it out as you go. You know, they came on the first day, Monty and Brett, maybe even like before we open, like we're out there okay. working on the building and, and they saw the, the door open and yeah, came in. Well, I just want to share a little bit of my experience because that's how we met. I was one of those, I was living in the neighborhood. I was passing by Deuce. This is in Venice, California. I was passing by Deuce on Lincoln Boulevard several times a day. And I would always, it's one of those things where you see something, but you don't really know what it is, but you figure it's probably just, you know, you just categorize it in your mind. It's just, oh, that's a CrossFit gym or that's a whatever. People are working out outside because it's all outside. And then I had been working out at Equinox Gym, which is like this really high end gym, towel service, the whole bit. And I decided that I was tired of just staring at myself in the mirror, listening to Jay-Z music while I was working out <laughs> by myself. And I wanted a little bit more of a community and I wanted some place that I could walk to. And that ended up being Deuce. I, I went to your website. I got, I saw a tutorial from one of the coaches and I think you had a, a little video in there as well. So I felt like I got to meet the people and it felt very community oriented, very homey. And then I called and I think I got Juan on the phone and I made an appointment right away and I came over. This is actually literally right after January 1st. So of whatever year that was a few years ago and came in and did the little practice thing so he could measure, you know, I guess if I was going to be safe <laughs> working out there. And uh, it's just, it was a really, it was outside and it was just, I just remember having it was one of the first times ever I had been working out for 20 years, probably more. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first times ever that I felt a sense of community going to work out. And then very quickly I would come to the yard and people would know me by name and 
we'd be, you know, encouraging each other, hitting personal records and and it wasn't that sense of danger that you hear about with CrossFit. It was actually it was more of a sense of leadership. And I know you guys have in the ethos of Deuce, you have this working definition for leadership. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think anytime you're going to try to develop something, there needs to be an agreement as to what it would mean to do it or to execute it. How do you, how is it that you define it? And leadership's one of those words that we just gloss over, you know, sounds good. I'd like more of that. But if I ask you what it is, you probably fumble on on your words, you know. So for us, we need to have a, a clear definition. And so being in leadership is essentially being accountable to the results, period. And that sounds simple, but it's a very helpful definition because based on that definition, uh, you get an understanding as to what the, the gig is all about, which means that when things go well, you can point to yourself for that. But when things go poorly, you also can only point to yourself for that. And it's about taking up responsibility. And that definition is also characteristically open. Anyone can engage in leadership. It doesn't matter how old you are, what your position is, how much you're paid, etc. And that definition also allows for teams to have all participants on the team to be in leadership. And it's a really critically important capacity to have, you know, and I really view it as a capacity. Everyone can be a follower that takes no extra work, but you have to opt into leadership. You have to choose that. And we are highly interested in people choosing leadership. And it's quite unremarkable for us to have folks, even talented folks, to come along and work for us who are just going to really follow directions well, you know, mm -hmm. really listen well. It's not really compelling to me or this organization. And so we're highly interested in developing and filtering for uh, leaders, leadership. Well, I just want to share one more personal experience. I, I remember I would be get I would get a little anxious walking to Deuce every day mm -hmm. because the program would push me to my edge. And it wasn't necessarily the coaches pushing you, it was you pushing you. And that's the kind of vibe that you got when you went there. Like no one's sitting there counting down the reps that you're doing, or no one's checking to make sure you do the whole thing. But you feel a sense of responsibility. It's almost like self-leadership where you want to push yourself to whatever your edge is. And I think you guys did a really great job of doing that. I would even say you changed my life. You specifically changed my life. I remember coming wow. to one class. I don't know if you remember this or not, but that day's workout was, uh, was 100 burpees. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like me I, and I maybe... Yeah. Maybe five other people. There was like this overweight guy, really sweet guy. There was like an older gentleman. There was a woman who was pregnant and like a few other people. And we were all, and I hated burpees up until that moment. I hated mm -hmm. burpees. Like most people say, you know, I hate, I hate burpees. Yeah. Saw this great t-shirt once says burpees. We hate you too. That's um, <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> so we're laboring through these 100 burpees. And I think there was only like 12 minutes to go in the class. And it was my first time doing that many burpees in a row. And it got to the point where the class the class time had ended and I still probably had 20 burpees to go. And everybody had finished. The pregnant lady finished. The overweight guy finished. Everyone had finished. And I just felt like I knew I had to do it. And, and at the same time, I wanted to quit. And, you know, there was no pressure coming from you as the group fitness instructor. But I remember you getting down and doing the, burp, the last burpees with me. And I just I really thought that was cool that you did that. And when I left there that day, I, I swore to myself I would never do burpees again in my entire life. <laughs> but then I think two days later, I decided, you know what? I can't let that thing have reign over me. And I remember doing them in my apartment, 100 burpees on my own. And it became a thing that I did. I put myself on a 30-day challenge of doing 100 burpees every day. And anyway, I just I felt like that was a breakthrough moment for me under the guise of working out, but really it was, it was really the mentality that I think you guys are teaching at Deuce. And that's one of the things that compelled me to want to have this conversation with you because it's so much more than just conditioning and strength training. <laughs> you know, the whole, the whole, the standard is something that I see hashtagged all over social media with people who are doing all kinds of stuff. 
And I've seen that in all of the coaches that you've employed. You guys have employed at Deuce and Deuce then went on to spread. And, and I was going there on a regular basis until I moved out of Dennis and, and started living this sort of nomadic life. But if I was still there, I'd, I'd, be, I'd definitely be still working out at Deuce. I've gone over the time that I allotted for this for you, and I, I apologize about that. But I, I'd have a couple more questions if you have a, a little bit more time to wrap the conversation yeah. up. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> So I'm curious, how are you defining success these days? Oh, man. I think success for me hasn't, the definition hasn't changed that much. I think I really attribute success in my mind to this idea of forward progress. You know, I'm really interested in development and evolution. And if I'm able to choose environments and engage in the type of behavior that'll like drive that progress, then I interpret that as as being successful. And so it's this exact same thing that I was attracted to as a young baseball player. It just now involves less of a sport context and more in an entrepreneurial sense. Beautiful. And the next question is, I always ask if somebody came to you and said, I wanted to start what you did and you know, what advice would you give them? But I'm really curious about this experience that you had where you got a chance to sort of coach or mentor these younger kids who wanted to play baseball. And I heard this in another conversation you had, but you, you mentioned to them that none of this is it matters at this point. Do you remember that conversation? And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like that can apply to the advice for people who want to basically do what you did. Yeah. And I think this is an observation that's nearly universal, you know, it's like, why, why is it that the greatest or the, the masters of their craft end up moving through their craft? And on the other end, they say, it's not about the music or it's not about hockey. It's not about the, you know, the X's and O's, right? But the only way they arrived there was moving through with this attention to detail and mastering those X's and O's of this thing. And that was my experience as, as well, is the best way to misunderstand the total value of something like playing baseball would be to think that it's about winning the tournament this weekend or you know doing whatever it takes to, I don't know, beat the crosstown rival. You know, these are the parameters these are the the environments that teach us lessons of transcendence and thank goodness that we can create meaning and associate meaning with things like the score of a baseball game or whether you get a hit or not as a feedback loop to learn these lessons but i finished baseball feeling so fit so prepared for anything because of how I sort of went about it that I felt this opportunity to share with these sort of young folks and specifically their parents that to miss the point would be such a tragedy. And I felt like because I was like five minutes out of professional baseball that I had the most, you know, the the iron was was hottest to deliver that message. And Part of me, <laughs> several times I've thought about going back into my email group. I would send them a weekly email update and just to send them, you know, today in 2020, an email, all the parents and say, so was I right about that? Or are we still upset that Timmy isn't batting third, you know? And, <laughs> and I think with making that experience objective now from this perspective uh, that they would agree, but when you're sort of caught up in it, you might get, you know, you know, you might miss the forest for the trees a bit. So if you're standing in Cooperstown with your son at the Hall of Fame and you see your son, not, you don't have a kid right now, but just projecting this into the future, your son sees that triple crown winners and puts his finger where you put your finger, what would you say to him? If he said what I said, I would, you know, if I was halfway intelligent, I would do exactly what my my dad did, which is support me in that desire. Hmm. 
you know, and I, I think what I'm calling for is not exclusion, but inclusion, like include those goals, include the frameworks, include the rules, the desire to win all of that, but transcend it a bit and to understand that on the other side of that pursuit are things that maybe matter more or, you know, at least just as much because I think people misunderstand what I'm saying. This is not a nihilistic view that says nothing matters. Therefore, we should not pursue anything. I think you only really have the authority to say that if you've pursued something with this fervor. No one wants to listen to someone on the corner saying that nothing matters who has not engaged in anything. Mm. But I, I will listen to Wayne Gretzky tell me that it's not about the hockey, mm -hmm. right? And it's through these experiences that we are, I think, granted the authority to speak to what really matters. You know, apathy is not sexy. It also doesn't teach us much, you know? So I think what we're all, what we would all really benefit from is choosing an environment that we could give our best effort in. And in that environment will likely come with some reflective feedback teaching moments. It could be ceramics. It could be making music. It could be trying to hit home runs. If you do it to the maximum level, you will be reflected back it's universal lessons that are true across all three of those disciplines, but on paper don't seem to be related at all. I love that, man. And that leads me to the last bit here. I just want to offer my own reflection just off the cuff from what I've heard. I've never heard your full story like that as told directly by you. So when I think back to your childhood and you getting into baseball and, and hearing more about the why and this idea of hitting and the sense of the miraculous, right? Trying to make the miracle happen through the mechanics of hitting a ball, it kind of, it reminds me of this idea that the miracle is the process. Like that is when you crack that code, no matter who you are, no matter what you've accomplished in your life, you've at some level experienced that the miracle was not in the outcome, but it was in the process. It was in never letting it rest until the good became the better and the better became the best. And it seems like You've exemplified that in every area of your life. And even if it wasn't baseball, if it was fly fishing, if it was bowling, if it was anything, hmm. we could be having this very same conversation about those learnings from all of those experiences. And you've certainly had your fair share of angels along the way who've kind of coached you and guided you literally throughout that process. And it shows up in everything that I've personally gotten a chance to experience working with you and your team today and hopefully other people listening to this will be get a chance to to cross paths with you. I know you do your leadership workshops all around the world and that's not just open to gym owners. It's really anybody who's interested in stepping up and becoming more accountable to those results that you're teaching and holding holding that standard. And you have your book, Go Write, which is your first published book. That just came out. There's an audio version that's also uh, available along with an e-version. And if you ever find yourself in Venice, California, and you already have a exercise, I wouldn't recommend someone who's never exercised before going to do this. <laughs> while they no, they can do it if they're going to commit to going for a period of time. But if you're just visiting, yeah, is it possible to, to drop in and do a, a little workout? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Do you want to add anything else to those reflections or to any of the ways of contacting you? Light, that was that was beautiful. And I, I appreciate you so much. I enjoy being around you. It's funny. Uh, coming onto the call, I sort of just noticed some feelings coming up. And I think you, you might get a, a laugh out of this. People often uh, are, are projecting on, on other people, right? And so mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm walking around the local grocery store and I bump into students or former students, they see me as maybe the the health authority in their life. And so they start, you know, stressing and divulging about the dessert they had last night or that they're, <laughs> they're sorry, you know, their elbow is a little sore. They'll be in the gym soon. All these things that I'm not thinking about, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, as a coach, that's the funny experience we have. But 
I'm sure you deal with your own version of it. And this mm-hmm. is what I, what I was experiencing coming on to the, the call with you is like, man, anytime I'm going to talk to light, I got to be on my, my P's and Q's between the ears, you know, and, and it's all my own uh, projection. <laughs> and so I'm sure everywhere you go, people are, uh, I've heard you talk about it on interviews too, but mm-hmm. people are assuming that you're, um, this sage mind who experiences no negative emotion. And it's just uh, it was a funny thing to come onto this and say, man, all right, I'm going to get up. I got to get ready to talk with my man here. So uh, <laughs> it always feels good to be, to be around you. And uh, I appreciate the, the human in you as much as I appreciate the wisdom and the lessons and, you know, who you are as a, as a professional as well. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much for that. And I look forward to getting a chance to cross paths very soon. And again, I just want to reiterate, you guys definitely read the book. There's so much more in there to the philosophy and the backstory. And you, and you tell so many other great stories of examples of people who have, who have transcended the orientation to results and who become fully immersed in the process. And as a result, they become the master's of mm-hmm. their field. I love the story about the uh, the barista. I started following mm. him, him on Instagram. <laughs> and, the, and Alberto, the, the hat maker. Yes. Seen his work. So many great stories. So thanks so much for being so generous with that and for sharing. And we'll, uh, we'll see each other soon. Yeah, like, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to my interview with Logan Gelbrick. Currently, Deuce is one of the only training facilities in Los Angeles that has thrived during quarantine mainly because it's outside. And it sort of reminds you of a prison yard. Well, a really nice prison yard, a really inspiring prison yard. Anyway, I encourage you to drop by if you're ever in Venice and definitely pick up a copy of Going Right, which is also available on audio. And if you want to hear more stories like Logan's, please subscribe to the podcast and check out the archive. I've got so many other interviews with amazing people who've overcome all kinds of challenges and obstacles in order to start their movement. And what I find more often than not is that the obstacle itself plays a big role in defining your movement. And by listening to these episodes, you may even find yourself moving closer in the direction of your calling or doubling down on your commitment to pursuing your purpose. And if you like what you hear, please, please, please rate this podcast. It really helps other listeners discover these inspirational stories. And as always, you can find everything that Logan and I discussed in the show notes, as well as a transcript of our entire interview on my website, which is lightwatkins.com slash tunnel. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for my daily dose of inspiration email, which is short and sweet daily inspirational messages that you'll get directly from me each morning. And if you have any feedback or suggestions, feel free to text it to me directly at 323-405-9166. Awesome. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you next week with a new conversation from the end of the tunnel.